And thanks very much. It really is uh, great to be back here in, in Sarajevo. Um, it's great to look around the room and see so many old friends and colleagues. Um, I'm <coughs> pleased to see Bosnia and Herzegovina getting the high level of attention uh, that it deserves. And I'm pleased and proud to be able to lend a voice uh, from the United States uh, to the discussion. Uh, and I want to thank you and others for organizing uh, this conference, the Center for Transatlantic Relations at Johns Hopkins Slice, which, as you say, I have uh, many links uh, going back some time, uh, and the America Bosnia Foundation. I really appreciate your putting this uh, together. I also want to thank, thank the many sponsors, and I think uh, just the fact that so many foundations have come together, I think 15 foundations uh, in Europe and the United States, is itself a sign that people are paying attention to Bosnia and Herzegovina, they are engaged, uh, and we have a stake in the country's future and want to support it. Uh, the U.S. Embassy as well, represented by Ambassador Moon, uh, is another sponsor for the conference uh, and a reflection of our um, uh, commitment. Uh, Mike also made mention of you as well, another uh, old friend. I want to thank him for his role in putting this together. Uh, Mike, as you all know, is, uh, is long, has a long-standing commitment to Bosnia and Herzegovina, both in the Senate and now more recently at SICE, and we're all very appreciative of that. Uh, when I say uh, being back, I'm so pleased to be back in Sarajevo. I've been here a number of times. The first time I visited the country uh, was in 1994, uh, at a time when this country was in the grips of a terrible war that would take the lives of over 100,000 people and displace millions of others. Uh, I obviously don't need to tell this audience uh, about the horrors of those dark years or of all the hard work that Bosnians have done uh, since then to rebuild the country. The United States and NATO in particular have made an enormous investment in that time to peace and stability in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And with our help, but mostly uh, as the result of the efforts of the people of this country, the country has come a very long way since. For the United States, our commitment to Bosnia and Herzegovina is an integral part of our long-standing commitment to Europe that is whole, free, democratic, and at peace. We believe strongly uh, that uh, the idea that all of Europe, uh, uh, that all of the, the Balkans must join Euro-Atlantic institutions, Europe will not be complete until all of the countries of this region are in those institutions, the European Union uh, and NATO. The Balkans are a critical part of Europe, historically, geographically, and culturally, and the future lies in Europe. The United States will always support an open door to the European Union and NATO, and we will remain ready to help all the countries of this region walk through that process. As part of this commitment, we take pride in what we have done with and for the Bosnian people. Uh, this commitment continues in the Obama administration, as demonstrated by the, by the persistent diplomatic engagement uh, and the attention that Bosnia and Herzegovina receives. Uh, Vice President Biden came here uh, very early in the administration on his very first trip uh, as Vice President, which was also my very first trip as Assistant Secretary uh, in May 2009. Uh, Secretary Clinton was here uh, last fall uh, in October, and as you know, uh, Deputy Secretary of State James Steinberg has made no fewer than six trips uh, to Bosnia and Herzegovina, more than any other country in the world uh, except Japan. A further indication of this administration's commitment and attention to the region. Congress also pays close attention, uh, uh, as is evidenced by the numerous congressional delegations that have come to Sarajevo. Uh, I think that's a reflection of the reality that many of us, uh, many senior officials in the U.S. government and the Obama administration have a deep personal connection with Bosnia. Uh, our professional identities and our understanding of international diplomacy and many careers uh, were forged uh, in the crucible of the Balkan Wars of the 1990s. And over the years, the United States has sent tens of thousands of American soldiers and diplomats to uh, establish and support the peace. We've invested roughly one and a half billion dollars to help rebuild, strengthen public institutions, foster better education, and promote economic development. We provide $300 million a year to help Western Balkan countries meet EU and NATO requirements. 
We are deeply and personally invested in the people of Bosnia and Herzegovina. In short, we've been your friends. Uh, and friends sometimes need to speak to each other bluntly. Bosnia and Herzegovina has made, as I have said, great progress since the Olympics of the 1990s. But in the last four or five years, it has not moved in the right direction. There's been a dangerous rise in nationalist rhetoric. The institutions of the state and the Dayton settlement have been brazenly challenged. There have been attempts to roll back the reforms that are necessary for Bosnia and Herzegovina to join the EU and NATO. In general, Bosnian politicians have been too willing to stoke ethnic fears and to privilege their own personal and political interests over the needs of the people that they should represent. If this pattern does not stop, and again, I owe it to my friends here to be one, then Bosnia risks being left behind and as the rest of the region moves forward. To a degree, we can already see this happening. With the help of the international community, many states in this region are making progress. Slovenia joined the EU in 2004. Albania and Croatia joined NATO in 2009. Croatia's EU candidacy is steadily advancing following the favorable recommendation of the European Commission just last week. Kosovo recently celebrated the third year of its independence and continues to make progress as a multi-ethnic democracy. Montenegro, only five years since independence, already has EU candidacy status and is a full participant in NATO's membership action plan. Serbia has applied for EU candidacy and is making progress along that path, including through the recent arrest and extradition of our Black. Of course, all of these countries still have a lot of work to do to realize their aspirations. But Serbia and Kosovo in particular need to advance in their dialogue and to work creatively to resolve the differences, their differences before they can move much further down the new path. Throughout the Balkans, people are free from violence, but they often do not have jobs. Hatreds of ease, but dangerous nationalism and prejudice persist. So Bosnia is hardly the only country in the region to face major challenges. But whereas other countries in the region are managing to make progress, however halting, in their efforts to join Europe, Bosnia and Herzegovina is not. To get back on the right path, Bosnia and Herzegovina must be able to function as a state that can deliver results for all its citizens. Reforms are needed for their own sake, but they're also needed to meet EU requirements in the country's international obligations. Only the greater integration in Europe will provide the stability and opportunity that the people of Bosnia and Herzegovina want and need for their children. The country's leaders specifically need to make progress in three areas, government formation, respect for state institutions in the Bacon framework and governmental reform. And let me say a word about each of these. Uh, the first issue is state-level government formation. Uh, it has been eight months since the elections, and this country still does not have state-level government. Without a broad-based coalition government, Bosnia cannot make the decisions necessary to progress on the Euro-Atlantic reform agenda. Efforts in the Parliament to start the process of appointing the Chairman of the Council of Ministers are a step in the right direction. But it is disappointing, it is disappointing that we still have not seen a serious initiative from any political party leader to form a government coalition. I mentioned traveling here with Secretary Clinton last October. Uh, we came here full of hope that the elections that have just taken place uh, would lead to the sort of government needed for the people of this country to progress on the EU path. Uh, eight months have now passed uh, without progress on that front, and I come back to say that we are looking to party leaders to show creativity in uh, forming a state level government that this country needs. There is simply no time to lose. Unless a government is formed soon, the economic consequences will be felt far and wide. Moody's has already downgraded the country's credit rating from stable to negative due to a stalemate. Deficit spending will result in budget shortfalls in both entities later this year. But the IMF and other international financial institutions have made clear that Bosnia and Herzegovina will not be able to access additional lending until the new state government is in place. Pensioners, veterans, and other vulnerable groups whose benefits have already taken a hit will see steeper and deeper reductions. Every day that passes without a government, Bosnia and Herzegovina falls further behind its neighbors and increases the risk that Bosnia and Herzegovina will fall off the European path. In this context, it is irresponsible for any party to, 
block formation of a government based on maximalist demands, be it a claim on a certain number of positions in the Council of Ministers, or for a specific ministerial appointment. All must be prepared to compromise. And those who refuse any further compromise are playing into the hands of those who seek to undermine Bosnia and its capacity to function as a state. I will be meeting this afternoon with some of the major party leaders, and we'll be looking forward to hearing from them their constructive ideas about forming a state-level government in the very near future. The responsibility to form a government that can advance the well-being of the citizens of Bosnia and Herzegovina should supersede any personal or political concern. Second, Bosnia and Herzegovina's politicians need to demonstrate their commitment to the Dayton framework and their willingness to abide by the decisions of state institutions. Like other members of the international community, the United States has repeatedly reaffirmed our support for the Dayton framework. One state, two vibrant entities, three constituent peoples. To reassure all the peoples of the country that their future is secure within Bosnia and Herzegovina, and that the goal is a more functional, not a more centralized, a more functional country capable of meeting European integration requirements. Similar efforts of reassurance have been made by some politicians in Sarajevo, including by President Bakir Izzabegovic, who has made conciliatory statements and offered greater flexibility on key reforms required by NATO and the EU. In return, others have intensified separatist rhetoric and sought to undermine Bosnia and Herzegovina's state institutions and the office of the high representative. One of the most recent challenges to the state was the April 13 decision by the RS Assembly to call a referendum on high representative decisions and on the legitimacy of the BIH court and prosecutor's office. The RS decision to step back from a referendum, referendum has headed off an immediate crisis. I hope that the leadership of Don Luca uses this opportunity to reevaluate its approach. Challenges made by the RS Assembly to the Dayton framework are not acceptable. They are incompatible with the goal of European integration. The leaders and the people of the RS need to decide whether they want to have a relationship with the United States and Europe or not. Those who think they can outweigh us and our allies in the Peace Implementation Council steering board are wrong. As I have already made clear, the United States has a significant personal and political investment here. We will not give up on Bosnia and Herzegovina or its people. We will continue to defend and strengthen existing state institutions, like the BIH State Court and Prosecutor's Office, which are doing critical work to combat terrorism, organized crime, and bring war criminals to justice. And the indirect tax administration, which has ensured a dedicated revenue stream for the BIH government. We will continue to promote further reforms, including of the Constitution, as are necessary for a functional state and for Bosnia and Herzegovina to meet the EU accession requirements. And we will stand by the High Representative and his decisions. We will not permit the closure of OHR until the agreed reform agenda is complete. We welcome the EU's determination to play a leading role in supporting positive change and protecting against threats to stability in Bosnia and Herzegovina. EU High Representative Ashton has named Peter Sorensen, a senior diplomat with 15 years' experience in the Balkans, to lead this EU effort. Uh, as Secretary Clinton wrote in an article co-authored with UK Foreign Secretary William Hay last, uh, last week, the United States will be strongly supportive of Ambassador Sorensen, using all the levers available to achieve progress, while working in close partnership with the Peace and Communication Council and the Office of the High Representative. And we will be prepared to take measures against any individuals and organizations that threaten to undermine the stability, sovereignty, and territorial integrity of Bosnia and Herzegovina. All levels of government in Bosnia must accept and respect Dayton. Finally, Bosnia and Herzegovina must move forward with the governmental reforms necessary for NATO and EU integration. Bosnia and Herzegovina's future lies in its integration into Europe, specifically membership in NATO and the EU. Once the state-level government is formed, we expect Bosnia and Herzegovina to move forward quickly to resolve the defense property issue so that it can participate in NATO's membership action plan, a step that the United States strongly supported last year. 
The EU has made clear that Bosnia and Herzegovina must take three steps in order to be considered for candidate status. Uh, one, establish a serious process to change the constitution, uh, to accommodate the Sadich Finci decision, act on state aid and provisions, second, and conduct the census. Uh, conduct the census. In addition, Bosnia and Herzegovina needs a well-functioning government at the state level that will have the power to engage effectively with Brussels and participate effectively in the EU accession process. We are convinced this is possible while protecting and preserving the decentralized government structures established in the Dayton Constitution. But it will require reform, including of the Constitution. The most immediate change necessary to comply with the basic EU human rights standards following the European Court of Human Rights ruling in the Sadich Finci case. And there will be need to be additional changes over the long term to ensure that the state has sufficient functionality and decision making capacity to comply with EU and NATO standards. Although the EU accession process will be difficult, it is the only viable alternative for this country. Threats to abandon the process are not or not participate in the process are incompatible with the needs of the people. Reform is also imperative in the entities. The Federation has far more government than it can afford. Years of mismanagement, corruption, and political infighting by the previous government have exacerbated the problem. Last year, the government had to adopt emergency austerity measures just to avoid bankruptcy. And the new Federation government still faces serious funding issues. The most recent EU progress report singled out the Federation in particular as being incompatible with the EU accession criteria. The new Federation government has gotten off to a good start. It has a fresh opportunity to make progress on privatization, which have languished for years due to corruption and political infighting, as well as on education and economic reforms. We regret that the HPZ parties declined to accept a compromise that would have included them in the coalition. No political party can claim the exclusive right, right to represent an entire election group. But we also recognize the concerns of those citizens who feel that the new government does not include representatives that they elected or who are committed to representing their interests. It is incumbent on the new government to demonstrate that it is, an act, that it is acting in the interests of all of the entity citizens. It is understandable that Bosnia and Croats, uh, as the least numerous of the three constituent peoples in Bosnia and Herzegovina, are concerned about their status within the Federation. But redrawing new internal boundaries to add a new entity or other layers of complexity to an already overly complicated government structure should be avoided. We welcome recent steps by HTZ parties to participate actively in the Federation Parliament. The Republic of Srpska faces its own serious economic challenges. The entity has exhausted all of its reserves from the RS Telecom and oil refinery privatizations and now faces a $500 million deficit. Last year, the RS economy grew at an anemic 1%. Forecast for this year is not much better. Provocative political rhetoric and attacks on the independence of the state judiciary is driving away foreign investment, which is a tenth of what it was just three years ago. The Republic of Serbia would be much better off if its leaders focused more on improving the economy and thus serving the needs of its citizens, rather than on promoting greater division within the country. A positive step would be to discuss with the Federation ways to harmonize their regulation and to promote inter-entity economic cooperation. These steps that I have described together constitute a path towards Europe. If Bosnia and Herzegovina's politicians make the necessary choices and compromises, we will be there in the United States to help with resources and political support. I think we've demonstrated over the years that we are prepared to do so. Uh, as Secretary Clinton said when she was here last October, the bonds between Boston and Herzegovina and the United States have been forged through harsh trials and historic crimes, and today we remain committed. But you should understand that our commitment will mean little if Bosnia and Herzegovina cannot summon the will to help itself. We stand ready to advise, assist, and support, but we can't do it alone. We need partners who share this vision, and are, who are prepared to compromise for the greater good. The people of Bosnia and Herzegovina deserve better. They deserve a Euro-Atlantic future. The young people of this country, particularly, want and deserve to join 
the European mainstream, to travel and work abroad, and to take advantage of all that the modern world and modern Europe has to offer. There are courageous actors in this country, many of whom are represented at this conference, who understand what needs to be done. Each of you has the responsibility to work in the interests of all Bosnian and Herzegovinians, to work across ethnic lines, and to avoid feeding ethnic fears. We are confident that in so doing, you can overcome your divisions, build a true European state, just as so many Europeans before you. No one can do this for you, but I can tell you that if we make the effort, the United States will be with you every step of the way. Thank you very much.